Um, so two weeks from today, October 30th, it looks like the other announcement was also about that. Um, we're going to the Broadcast Career Builder Conference. Um, it's a conference put on by the Michigan Association of Broadcasters for people interested in radio, TV, journalism, and media in general. Um, it's a conference for high schoolers interested in going into that area, as well as uh, college students who are currently studying, like you guys, in any kind of related area, and for like young professionals kind of thing. It's a day-long conference in Lansing. We take the awesome little SAU shuttle to get there. I'll drive it. It'll be incredible. I'm going to go like 56 on the highway. <laughs> and um, it's a day full of all sorts of speakers and networking with like actual like, television and radio stations and media outlets. Um, you get a chance to like learn a lot of resume and career building type of stuff. Um, the main speaker this year, for those who are interested in watching the game tomorrow, and they'd be also interested in seeing uh, Dan Dickerson in person. He's the keynote speaker of that. Voice of the Tigers, you know, Tigers, sports. That's about, like my sports knowledge right there. <laughs> and um, a variety of other people. And I'll be talking about some of the university offerings in radio, the Spring Harbor. Um, a lot of the big colleges go to this, Michigan State, CMU, and also some of the high schools with that media programs as well. So, all that to say, today is the final day on here. Um, to be able to register for that, the cost to you is $20 personally. Then we provide uh, the lunch once you're there and the ride together and everything. So, I'm the person to talk to. Rachel, R-A-C-H-E-L, at arbor.edu, or up right inside the doors of the radio station if you're interested. And even if you don't know anything about media, it can be of interest to you. So totally valuable Michigan Association of Broadcasters. It's pretty awesome in what they do for students and learning as well as um, professionals in the whole world. So if that's your interest, then that is available, and I'm the person to talk to you if I to get to go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much. Sorry. Can you hear Sure. Becky has an announcement. Okay. And you can take this up with you and maybe do too. Yeah, you can make an announcement. Look at it. Look at it. Oh, yeah. Except it's the only problem with this announcement is that the cover is green, not blue. Mary's just biased. <laughs> I'm very excited about the game. Jen's new book is out. Woo! <laughs> If you are an intro to film, I just delivered copies up to Elizabeth Richardson's office and if you're in the online class and you're going to get an email about it so you'll be able to do that. It kites, you can order it on Amazon, it comes out the 31st of there. So sweet. Remote virtue, a Christian guide to intentional media Congratulations, Professor. Lester. Thank you very much. Yay! Uh, just to note, if you think you wanted to run up there and pick it up today, you probably can't do that. I know Elizabeth isn't here today, so but she should be here all next week. Yeah. Okay, my announcement. Oh, yep. I just want to give a shout out to another author because I did collect the haikus of people who uh, <laughs> couldn't be here. So Evan Roberts wins with "My name is Evan." I have work on Fridays. Then it's unfortunate. Which, oh. if you count it out, came in haiku form. So, if you know Evan, tell him kudos. But tell him also to quit his job and be here. All right. <laughs> All right, I am uh, touching base with you regarding another opportunity on Friday, October 30th. In this room, uh, if you don't know, I am the debate and forensics coach for our department and for the university. And we do compete, we travel along. And I only see one person in here who's on the team, and that's Tara. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's required for some people and not required for others, but I really encourage <coughs> you to consider it. If you ever want to be in front of people <coughs> speaking, doing something in front of people, then the first six and the is just a great opportunity to do that. And so on this particular uh, day and time right here on uh, Friday, October 30th at 10 o'clock, I'm bringing in a special guest to talk about the art of persuasion and uh, debate and argument. And so she's actually going to be talking about some things uh, in a very elementary level about how does you think on your feet quickly about current events and how does you engage in conversation and persuasive argument with people. Then it will also break into an opportunity to actually practice uh, some parliamentary debate 
So she is going to be giving some rules and some rundown as to how that works on a competitive level, which I would love to talk to you further if you have interest in, in either debating or forensics. How many of you know what forensics is? Okay, not enough of you. Forensics is competitive public speaking, and while it has the root of like CSI, it means the same, the word means the same to get to the truth of. So that's why you can have the forensics in, in science, forensic science, but this is forensics uh, communication, and it means to get to the truth of something. And so forensics, competitive speaking, it happens across all genres. If you're a drama person, if you're poetry, if you're <coughs> informative speaking, if you're impromptu, you love impromptu, then you can literally compete against other people from other schools, <coughs> other universities and colleges uh, in those areas. So if you want to know more, uh, feel free to touch base with me. I'm, my office is up in the com suite and my name's too difficult to spell. So just stick a note in my mailbox uh, up in the com suite. So. Thank you. Thank you. Woo! a guest speaker who is an alum of Spring Arbor. His name is Nate Lattimore. I'm really excited that he is here today and I think he has a great message to share. Ten years ago, he was basically in the same place that some of you are. He was about to graduate and go critically participate in the contemporary world. He obviously had some plans and some dreams and as you might expect, didn't really go as planned. Over the course of the past 10 years, he's worn a lot of different hats. I'm not going to give them away because I suspect he'll be talking about some of those. Uh, but most recently, and notably, he spent the last few weeks in Grand Rapids at the Fountain Street Church, where his installation was selected as part of the Art Prize competition in Grand Rapids. And if you haven't heard of Art Prize, it's amazing and exciting and fun and unlike any other art competition that attracts artists from all over the world. Uh, so his installation dealt with the topic of immigration, a topic that is very close to his heart and he'll be talking about that. But I did ask him to talk mostly about what the past 10 years have been like for him and to share some of the lessons that he learned on that atypical path. So um, I'd like to introduce our 2006 alum, Nate Lattimore. So, like Dory said, I graduated in 2006, and my wife, Catherine, was in school with me for a while. Um, we actually had our first class together right here. It was a history class with Professor Niels, and I remember so much from that class. Um, when I was in college, Facebook was new. Uh, that's how old I am. And, uh, the clock tower is also being built over here, so it's been a while. But. I'm not here as a communications expert or uh, a very successful person. I'm here as someone who was in your shoes and thought I had my whole life planned out. I thought a college degree uh, would get you what you wanted. Um, and so I think this, if I had heard this message when I was in your shoes, I don't know if my journey would have, would have looked very, uh, very different, but I think my thought process through the journey uh, would have looked a lot different. So, I was a comm major with an advertising and public relations concentration, and I was a business minor, so I had dreams of copywriting. I wanted to work for an ad agency, and I thought the creative side with the analytical business side, I would be a shoe in for everywhere that I sent my resume. Um, I, while I was here, I kind of morphed spiritually and politically, um, and it kind of, you'll see later, but um, I, was, I was very conservative when I got here, and I'm not going into like conservatives right, conservatives wrong, but um, throughout the course of my four years um, with professors like Mary and uh, Morgie Monville and um, Ethan Moore and Jerome, I just had classes that kind of um, developed me spiritually and politically, and they didn't give answers, they just asked really good questions. Um, so, 
I graduated, and Kath and I decided that it was time to get married. And I figured we had it all figured out, right? This is life's journey. So you start, you graduate, you get married. It's sunny. There's a couple of hills, there's a couple of valleys, but it's just a straight shot to the end. You put cruise control on, and you don't even have to pay attention. You just make money, and then you have a family, and then it's over. So, uh, shortly after we got married, we decided to move uh, to Charlotte. And Charlotte was, according to friends, a land of plenty. And I actually had a roommate who told me that if you move to Charlotte, he, he lives in Charlotte, they currently live in Charlotte, but he lived in Charlotte um, before he moved down. He said, if you guys move to Charlotte and you can't find a job, you're an idiot. And I was like, that's perfect, because I'm not an idiot. So I'm going to move to Charlotte and I'm going to get a job. So we moved to Charlotte. And uh, it was Catherine's first move away from home. Uh, so we were 11 hours away from family, and she'd never been away from family. So there was that stress. Um, and I decided that I wasn't even going to send resumes out during the summer before we moved. I was just going to get a job when we got there. So here is Charlotte. It's a beautiful city. Um, yeah. So when I got there, I realized that life's journey looks more like this. So we were kind of somewhere like right here. And, um, I realized that there are choices to be made, and uh, those choices could lead you anywhere. So I began emailing prospective organizations and businesses that I had interest in working for, um, sending resumes out, and I didn't hear from a single one. It was probably two months of applying online, calling, um, and not a single response back. And that was a huge blow to my ego, and it kind of made me um, bitter and angry. Uh, I was going to say, I haven't been back to Spring Arbor in 10 years, um, because uh, Um, this bitterness, um, <coughs> kind of made me um, have a feeling of resentment <coughs> to my time here, and uh, so, yeah. So anyway, back to resumes. So yeah, bitter, angry that I couldn't get a job. And it, we, we had been married for about a month. And um, so much stress out of marriage when your focus is all on uh, finding a job and living up to those expectations that you had when you got out of school. Um, so this is, this is me, month two. I decided that I was going to print resumes and I literally walked, <laughs> walked um, corporate parks with resumes. And if, they, if you couldn't get to the office, I would write down the names of the offices in these buildings. And Charlotte has a lot of corporate parks. And I would go home, and I would send resumes to all these. I had a notebook full of names. And I would send resumes to all these people and all these organizations. And still nothing. And I was so, like, it broke me. I was really broken. And uh, it led to, I had never been depressed in my life, but after this experience, there were days when I would sit on the couch and just watch, like, Real Housewives of Orange County, like, binge watch <laughs> uh, cable TV. And um, I, would cry, I would call home and just, like, weep to my parents about how, like, this isn't working out. Like this is a, uh, this was supposed to look a lot different. Um, but eventually, I realized I needed to do something. So there was a, a high-end golf course uh, next to our apartment complex, and they were hiring a maintenance worker. And I had done golf course for golf in high school, and that's what I knew. 
So I said, I, I, I have to work. So I got a job at this high-end golf course. And my time there could have looked really good. I could have made friends. I could have networked with the people there. But instead of doing that, I was angry that I was in a job that I had when I was in high school. So again, a failed, um, failed relationships because of um, unmet, unmet expectations on my part. Um, I worked there for about, uh, let's see here. I worked there for about uh, four months, I think, and I went to a job fair and just, again, handed out resumes like crazy. And finally, uh, I got a, a call back from the Charlotte <coughs> Medicine, the AAA affiliate of uh, the Chicago White Sox. And I loved baseball. And I thought, you know, this is this is going to be great. So I went in for the interview. I got an internship. So this is a year after graduation from college. They gave me an internship, and it paid three hundred dollars a month. And I was like, I don't even care. Three hundred dollars. That's like that'll buy us a couple of weeks of groceries. And I was working during homestands, working seventy hours a week uh, as an intern. You're there from eight o'clock in the morning to whenever the game ends at night. And um, that time, you know, I was, I was happy. I thought I'm finally on this career path that um, I want to be on. And one of my problems is my faith fluctuates with um, like experiences in my life. Instead of being <coughs> constant that it's supposed to, it tends to go up and down. Maybe a lot of people have uh, experienced that. But so I got the job at the nights and. My faith was great. Like God was good. God is the provider that He's given us. Um, um, yeah, just content with the job that I've gotten. So I interned there all summer, and um, at the end of the season, they brought me on full time as a sales rep and events coordinator. So my job was to call people, sell season tickets, sell group packages. And if you know anything about baseball, they don't play in the fall and they don't play in the winter. And uh, it's just dead. So you sit in an office and you call people in November about baseball that's not going to happen until April. And uh, I was meeting sales goals. I had a, built a client um, network that they were all happy. Uh, I was making money. And I just had this feeling that. This isn't what I'm supposed to be doing. We read a book, uh, The Areas of Soil Evolution by Shane Claiborne. And if you want your life right and just blown apart, read that book. And um, so that kind of led us to like, there's got to be something more than this, this corporate ladder. Um, I didn't really know what my passions were or where I wanted to go. So a random email to a boat shop in Saugatuck landed me a job as a carpenter restoring wood boats. So I decided we just settled down and take a risk. So again, no experience in wood boats. The guy thought, I guess I had a uh, get to it attitude and was eager to learn. So he hired me out as an apprentice, so we moved to Holland. And um, we had never been to Holland. It, we moved there in January, and it started snowing days. <laughs> Until like March, and it was just feet of snow, and so that was crazy. And um, we were like dirt poor, right? So I got a job as an apprentice. Catherine's job as a baker kind of fell through; it was a little sketchy. And uh, our date nights were a Little Caesars pizza, and if we had enough money, we would buy a two-liter soda to go with it. So like, this is. Three years out of college. So things still, like I was expecting like this job with all these benefits and here we were like little Caesar's pizza and water most of the time. Oh yeah, we have the beach on that, so that, that's free. So that's good. Um, and uh, while there, so these are some of the boats that we built. I'm still there by the way, but so this is a Reba. And I like I said, I moved. Uh, into a carpenter position, then to a program or a project lead. And some of the projects that I've worked on have won national and international awards for um, 
in the voting world, it's a big deal. But in the voting world, where they don't like big votes, it's not that great. But um, <laughs> we bought a house while I was here. Um, so we were committed to Holland. Here's another boat. And I also started a small LLC called Mid and Coast Surf. And I make um, hollow wood stand up paddle boards. And so things were kind of looking up as kind of I gained some traction in my career. But I still thought that there was something more, right? There's, I, I don't believe that, um, how should I say this? Maybe my my faith and my vocation are too connected, and I thought that my faith and my vocation should be like one and the same. So there's this constant thought process of should I be building with boats? Um, what am I doing for advancement of the kingdom? Um, and this inner dialogue um, kind of led us. To the first attempt we did at this was we decided we we're going to live in community. So Shane Claiborne's big on that. So we redid our whole basement and met a couple and we were like, you should come live with us and we'll be hippies together. And uh, as you can imagine, it was a complete disaster. Um, to do that, you have to be um, completely unselfish. You have to be uh, willing to sacrifice. And Catherine and I, weren't ready to do that. And Catherine had gotten pregnant right around that time, so that just added to the tension of we're about to have a kid and there's people living in our basement. So there was like this awkward <laughs> there was this awkward point of um, knowing that we didn't want to have them there. And then finally one day they were like, we think we're gonna move. And we were like, oh that's that's terrible. But we were, it was actually for the best. Um, and then I kept on with this inner dialogue of like, what is my career supposed to be? What am I supposed to be doing with my faith? And that, along with a lot of discussions and research, um, brought me back to this place where I was like, I gotta go back to school. Um, it's been eight years since I graduated my bachelor's. Um, that doesn't look bad great on the resume if you're trying to enter into a new career. And I decided that I wanted to do uh, nonprofit work. So I enrolled at Eastern University's Masters of uh, Nonprofit Management, Masters of Science in Nonprofit Management. And I went there as a carpenter, and the first day we were there, I sat down and I was surrounded by mid level to senior level management of pretty major nonprofits. Uh, like there was a woman who worked for Big Brother, a lot of people that worked for hospitals. And again, I was like, what, what am I doing here? Like, I was super scared. I didn't have a clue about nonprofits. But um, they kind of welcomed me in. Like, I was the only, there was 10 of us, and I was the only male in the cohort. So they kind of took me in and uh, showed me how nonprofits work. And uh, I focused on social entrepreneurship while I was there. And that whole time gave me space to dream and kind of think about how my work and my faith can act together to bring change to essentially a hurting world. And um, my capstone focused on a fashion startup that hires at-risk individuals to stitch clothes um, to sell in the market. So, and while I was at Eastern, this was two years ago, there was a lot happening with um, uh, kids coming from Central America fleeing drug cartels and essentially riding the tops of trains to the border and then trying to get through the desert to come to America. And as a parent, I couldn't imagine that things could be so bad that parents would say, here's a guy that you don't know, he's going to take you thousands of miles away and then you're going to walk through a desert and then you're going to try and find some distant family member that we haven't had contact with. Like, that's crazy. Something terrible is happening there for that to happen. And um, a lot of these kids were caught uh, at the border, or even in Mexico, and sent back to where they were fleeing. And I was angry as a citizen of America. I was angry as a Christian. And I was really upset that 
this was happening, and the media was calling attention to it, but it didn't seem like there was much being done. Um, it just seemed like, I'm sure people cared, but it, it didn't seem like they cared enough to do anything about it. So I visually, in my mind, had an idea of like what was happening. And uh, let's see here. So this is what is on the Statue of Liberty. There's a poem on the Statue of Liberty. The last couple lines are really famous. Give me your tired, your poor, your humble masses, yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuge of your teeming shore. Send these the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. So that's what people are seeing as they come to our country. But is that what our country is doing? And I didn't think they were. So I made a sketch in a notebook of, um, <coughs> uh, yeah, so of a uh, of what I thought was happening. So in my mind, you have this like these great um, dreams and desires of our country, right? And we can essentially study what we want to study. We can pursue what we want to pursue. Um, we choose food based on color and smell, and that's crazy. Like, if you can say, I don't want a sandwich because I don't like roast beef, like, you're privileged, right? Um, and then, <coughs> what our borders were doing to what was going on inside of our country. So I just kind of thought, like, uh, our borders, our ideologies and beliefs as a nation are keeping people from accessing uh, what we have to offer. So I set this. I wanted to be legitimized by a, a nonprofit. Like, I wanted this concept. Like, I liked it, but I wanted someone that worked in this field to say, no, that's exactly what's going on. So I sent a random email out to uh, Justice for Our Neighbors. It's a national organization through the United Methodist Church. And the executive director called me and said, how can we make this happen? And connected me with our local um, region, or our local director, and uh, we sat down for lunch and she said, yes, this needs to happen. And that meeting kind of gave me the, uh, the push I needed to actually pursue this idea. And so I entered this drawing into archives. And this is all it was. And I didn't tell anybody that I had never worked with metal in my life. And that I really don't know how to do that. Uh, but like I have this great concept. And like I think it can work. So I paid the registration fee. And within a week, there were five venues that had emailed me and said they were interested in hosting it. And Fountain Street Church is kind of a, a weird thing in Grand Rapids. It's a liberal theology church that's focused on kind of social justice. But their venue is strictly art to change the world. So every year at our prize, they have 30 artists come in with art that they think um, could create conversation that might change the world. So I bought four sheets of steel and loaded them on a trailer. And my friend had a plasma cutter. And we learned how to cut steel and build a sculpture. And I had never gold beefed anything either. So will attest to this. I watched YouTube videos on how to gold beef and bought some. And the night before I had to install this, I was almost puking. I was so nervous that it wasn't going to work. And uh, so I went to Fountain Street Church and installed it. And uh, so this is this doesn't really do scale justice. But uh, that's, the top of the gold leaf is 16 feet. And then this is 8 feet, and it's 4 feet wide. And then inside of the column is the new Colossus, that poem that we just read. And, um, the goal for this whole thing was to just create conversation during our crisis about immigration policy in America. And I didn't want to tell people you're wrong or I'm right. I just wanted it to be talked about. And as a carpenter, um, making things is what I do. And I figured that was the best way to get a conversation going. Um, so, Beginning of our prize, this woman walks in, and on her shirt, 
it says 100 women, 100 miles. And I had heard a couple stories online about this march. There's 100 women who are personally uh, connected, either married or they are themselves, uh, illegal immigrants. They're marching from a detention center in Pennsylvania down to Washington, D.C. to bring about change for illegal immigrants. And, um, so I said, you know, I see your shirt. Are you connected with this at all? And she's like, oh, yeah, I was one of the walkers. <coughs> Are you kidding me? Like, this is awesome. And uh, she said, I was the only one from Michigan. And I said, well, that's great. Can I show you my sculpture? And she turned around and looked at it and burst into tears. And, like, I was kind of taken aback by that. I just went into my, like, rambling of, like, what this sculpture is. And she finally composed herself and just said thank you. And that single conversation um, affirmed uh, me making the sculpture. I think if I wouldn't have heard anything else, just that one thank you uh, was enough to realize that I had accomplished uh, what I set out to accomplish. So I have some uh, some words of wisdom for you uh, as you go on through your college career and into your um, life that it's going to be a lot crazier than you could have ever imagined. Um, the first is stay hungry and humble. Uh, never settle. Avoid complacency. There's always more to do, and there's always more to learn. But you have to do it with humility. Um, the world is full of arrogance, and it takes special people to create change. And when you do it humbly, that's when people notice. And uh, also, doing it humbly, there's a lot of people out there that probably know way more than you do, and can probably do everything that you do way better. Don't be mad at them. Don't be jealous of them. <coughs> Learn from them. Don't be afraid to dream and ask what if. If you think something's cool or want to try something, do it. If you don't know how, learn how. If you don't have the money, start it, and the money will come. Um, I sat at a round table when I was pursuing my master's, and it was this, the fashion ecosystem of Grand Rapids is all represented. So it was like Kendall College, and a couple of designers, and a couple of stitchers, and they were all dreaming of like this big space where people could come and sew or bring a design of clothing and have it made. And the question came up, you know, like, what about funding? And the director or owner of AK Rich, which is a high-end fashion store in Grand Rapids, said, I don't want to talk about money, because money's the easy part. And he's right. Like, if your idea is good enough, and if it's viable, there's someone out there with a lot of money that will back it. And we live in a world now, too, where if you need money and have a good idea, there's websites you can go to like Kickstarter and raise money. Like you just have to communicate your idea well and somebody will come along and back it. Um, an example of this, I went to the empowerment plan in Detroit when I was in school for my master's and uh, her story is pretty cool. She was making these coats, she designed a coat for the homeless that, um, it's a, a coat but there's also like this sleeping bag that's tucked in in the back, so at night they have a sleeping bag to sleep in. And she was handing these out to the homeless people in Detroit, and this woman came up and started yelling at her, and she was like, what's going on? And the woman said, we don't need coats, we need jobs. Like, we can buy our own coats. We need a job to make money. So she came up with this, you know, like, why am I not hiring these women to make these coats? And uh, uh, the owner of Carhartt heard about the idea because she was passionate about it and told everybody about it and sat her down at his desk and said, how much money do you need to start this? And she named a dollar figure and had a check in her pocket that day. Mm -hmm. So if you're passionate and if your idea is good, somebody will come along and fund it. Um, don't let trivial things dictate your life. Uh, for eight years, I let my circumstances uh, kind of control my emotions, right? So I was working on a golf course and I was angry and bitter and um, then I wasn't happy with the nights. Um, and 
I let that control my family life. I let it control friendships. Um, I let it control my relationship with the university that I graduated from that taught me to be a lifelong learner and morphed me into who I am today. Um, and back to the faith thing. Your faith, I've, it's, I'm bad at this. Like, this is still an ongoing process for me. But like, <coughs> this should be your faith, right? And this should be your life, right? So trying to figure out how to make your faith remain constant, like, I'm not great at it, but I notice that when I do devotions in the morning, my day looks a whole lot different than when I don't. Um, Catherine does, it does a really good job of like keeping me in check with that, um, and also uh, like how things that are affecting me play into our family. We have two kids now, so she's always uh, making sure that my job.